for all being here. This is my second day of talking. I already recognize some faces from yesterday. Today, I'll be focusing on giving a talk on chronic graptosis host disease of the skin, and hopefully won't be any technical issues today. Okay, and so hopefully the knowledge that I give you today will help you understand what chronic graft versus host, of, host disease of the skin is, what are the symptoms, I'll talk about the overview a little bit, what are the symptoms of chronic graft versus host disease of the skin, some of the treatment principles, this probably sounds a little bit better, and treatment options that are available, um, other necessary supportive care in order to optimally manage chronic graft versus host disease of the skin, and some of um, some uh, issues that you should know of how to prevent uh, any graft versus host disease flares and how to prevent some late effects of having this uh, syndrome such as secondary skin cancers, which can happen down the road. Um, and then lastly, just to summarize the overall presentation and to give some last pointers of how to empower yourselves with, uh, with uh, having this knowledge and, and taking ownership of your health, okay? Okay. So, uh, graft versus, chronic graft versus host disease of the skin can be a common long-term complication of having a donor transplant. It's usually an early sign of the systemic or the multi-organ form of chronic graft versus host disease. Um, and as you all are aware, graft versus host disease uh, is where the donor cells, in addition to attacking and eradicating any uh, uh, any cancer cells, sometimes these or any other abnormal blood cells, sometimes these donor cells will recognize healthy tissue in the patient and as well attack them and cause this overwhelming inflammatory disorder. Okay, so usually the skin is involved in up to 80 percent of uh, survivors with chronic graft versus host disease, and the damage that's done to the skin or other organs that might be involved um, is usually due to inflammation, uh, scarring, and a fibrotic process. So that's what differentiates chronic graft versus host disease from the acute form. Chronic graft versus host disease is a syndrome of uh, fibrosis forming, scar tissue. And so risk factors for chronic graft versus host disease include having a mismatched donor or using an unrelated donor. However, these days, we're actually getting better sort of overcoming this risk factor by improving uh, graft versus host disease prevention regimens, uh, as well as sort of treating the donor cells with certain modifications before we infuse them into the patient. So hopefully, uh, this risk factor will be taken off the list in the future, okay, because we're getting better. Um, older age, either the patient or the donor is a risk factor for chronic graft versus host disease. Having a female donor uh, cells put into a male, do male uh, patient is a risk factor. Use of peripheral blood stem cell source versus a bone marrow source has been uh, a published, uh, has been actually studied in a clinical trial and has been shown to be a, a risk factor for graft versus host disease. But again, we're coming out with better regimens for prevention of graft versus host disease. So hopefully we can overcome this risk factor. And definitely having a prior history of having acute graft versus host disease is a risk factor for having chronic form. So just to understand uh, what gets affected in chronic graft versus host disease of the skin, first it's kind of important to understand how your skin is made up. We have different layers of the skin. Um, the topmost layer of the skin, which is the area of the skin that we see every day, is called the epidermis, right? And the epidermis, uh, what's important about the epidermis is that it basically protects you from all the outside elements. It protects you from infections. Um, it gives you the color of your skin. The next layer below that, the dermis, uh, is where uh, we find our sweat glands or our hair follicles. As well, this is where some of our fine nerve endings that can uh, have uh, be involved in sensory or very small blood vessels begin. Okay, and then the subcutaneous, the deepest layer, is the area of the skin that sort of provides insulation. Um, for uh, warmth and helps regulate uh, hot and cold. As well, the subcutaneous fatty tissue is important for sort of uh, attaching the dermis part of your skin 
to the underlying tissue overlying your muscle and bone. So this understanding this helps you understand how if chronic graft versus host disease develops, how it's affecting you and your skin, okay? Some of the symptoms that you might be experiencing. So for example, if chronic graft versus host disease just affects the topmost layer, the epidermis, usually patients will see a change in the color of their skin. They may see some hyperpigmentation, some redness, or some purplish color plaques, or they may develop a rash, um, a, a reddish rash. Um, if the chronic graft versus host disease involves the dermis layer, again, this is where this, this is the physiology of this is fibrosis, right? Scar tissue fibrosis. And this area is where the nerves sit, the sweat glands, the hair follicles. So this is where sometimes patients will have some nerve damage, some burning sensation or some numbness, um, uh, as well, uh, they may have trouble uh, producing uh, sweat, okay? Um, and as the chronic graft versus host disease involves deeper layers um, in the scar tissue form, this is the uh, time period where we start seeing the sclerotic form, the very um, tight, tightening, thick form of uh, chronic graft versus host disease of the skin, uh, and this is because the fibrosis is kind of pulling down the skin and making it attach very tightly to the bone and the underlying muscles, okay? Uh, so other epidermal tissue organs that can be affected are include the nails, and some, some of you may have experienced uh, some nail breakage or the nail bed lifting off, um, some ridging. Sometimes it's due to chemotherapy, but then when there are definitely other signs of chronic graft versus host disease, usually it's those donor cells that are causing some of the, the symptoms that you're having or some of the changes that you're seeing in your nails, okay? And then as well, uh, graft versus host disease can affect hair growth, okay? The donor cells will like to attack the hair follicles. And so some men and women will have areas of hair loss or what we call alopecia. So what are the symptoms? Some of, I'm sure some of you have experienced some of this. Uh, itching is very common, okay? Thickness and tightness of the skin. As it progresses, uh, some patients can have some joint stiffness. Sometimes muscle cramps, and that's again because the, the fascia and the tissue is very tight around the muscles. Uh, and sometimes tingling or burning or, or pain sort of lancing across the skin. And again, these are because the nerves are affected. Okay, as chronic graft versus host disease can progress, as it progresses, sometimes the skin will get very thin. And usually because patients are also taking steroids, it's already also contributing to thin skinness and sometimes tearing of the skin, okay? Sores can develop, and it takes a while for them to heal because graft versus host disease is a, uh, you know, the whole basis of it is this immune dysregulation. So it's very hard for the body to heal wounds in a, in a very rapid way. And as well, if you're on steroids or an immune suppression, these medications also delay wound healing. For patients who have uh, skin involvement around the lungs, the thorax, the chest, Sometimes with deep involvement uh, with chronic graft versus host disease, it puts, it kind of restricts how well your, the lungs can expand. So some patients will experience shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, um, they feel like they can't get a good breath in, and sometimes fluid will accumulate in the lung. And this is because the, the underlying fascia is, is, has formed scar tissue, so it's very difficult for it to be flexible and to expand appropriately. Okay, again, regulation of skin temperature is, uh, can be problematic here, and that's because the top layer is often exfoliating for patients who have diffuse um, erythematous uh, 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 graft versus host disease. Um, 
And for some patients, uh, men and women, they'll complain that um, there is some uh, genital burning or dryness or sometimes difficulty urinating. So when complaints like that occur, definitely these are um, symptoms and signs that you should report to your doctor. And sometimes a specialist, like a urologist or a gynecologist, is, is consultation is necessary. So what are the most common forms of the disease? So this. The way this is laid out is kind of from, again, superficial to deep. So along the epidermal surface, uh, I've listed some medical terms that you might hear coming out of your doctor's mouth, your transplant doctor's mouth. So many times when only the superficial layer is involved, we say that patients have sort of a, a lichen planus-like or lichenoid features of chronic graft-versus-host disease of the skin. Sometimes you'll hear the word poikiloderma. And what that means is just Differences in the skin color, either hyperpigmentation, where the skin is very red or purplish looking, or hypopigmentation, where there isn't much uh, skin color. Um, sometimes um, in those areas of skin changes, you can see small little capillaries breaking, okay? As the, um, the deeper levels are involved, it becomes, you'll hear the word sclerosis more frequently, okay? And this refers to sort of the underlying fibrosis and scar tissues that's forming. And, we'll, and I'll show you some pictures of these. So for example, here we have a patient who has a diagnosis of lichenoid chronic graft versus host disease, okay? He has these um, red and sometimes a little bit purplish looking plaques uh, or papules, and that's what we describe as sort of these raised lesions, little swellings above the skin. Uh, if you were to run your hand flat, you would feel some raised bumps. Okay, and sometimes these lesions can be very localized, just to one extremity, one arm, or one part of the, the body, or sometimes they can be very diffuse like this. They can involve the skin around the face, and particularly around the eyes, the orbits, Okay, uh, GVHD can affect the mucous membranes. So every time you've gone for your, uh, you know, a, a follow-up uh, visit with your transplant doctor, they always want to look at inside your mouth. Um, our mucous membranes, which line our mouth through our GI tract all the way to our rectum and anus, um, is epi uh, epidermal skin, and it can be involved in graft-versus-host disease. And so this is an example of the inflammation going on the. In the, on the lips. These little fine white lines are called Wickham striae, and this is something that we can commonly see, I won't, I won't say commonly, but sometimes see in the clinic, okay? And as we look inside the mouth, these fine white lacy, um, lacy patterns are often seen on the buccal mucosa or on the hard palate at the top of the mouth, on the top of the mouth. And so this gives us an indication that um, this, this process is occurring. And sometimes when these develop, the patients will be reporting to us at the same time that they're having increased sensitivity to foods, um, irritation, dryness, okay? Difficulty swallowing foods if, if some of the upper GI tract starts becoming involved. Okay, so as I said before, um, in our epidermal layer, that's where our melanin or our skin color pigmentation cells are. And if those cells are being attacked and they're not working correctly, some patients can um, get some dispigmented skin or vitiligo. And this is what happens when patients develop vitiligo. They lose their melan melanin in that area of the skin and they have very, um, light patches compared to the rest of their body, okay? This is not very common, but it can occur. So as we continue, as chronic graft versus disease continues to involve the deeper layers of the skin, uh, this is examples of fibrosis occurring, or sclerosis occurring along the tendons, okay? So scar tissue um, or fibrosis kind of gives this grooving sign along the major tendons of, of the muscles. Sometimes you can get a appearance of cellulite without any overlying skin rash. But seeing, uh, seeing this sort of rippling pattern, especially along the inner thighs, the, I'm um, sorry, inner arms, the inner thighs, 
the, the torso and the abdomen. This is a sign of deep, deeper involvement of chronic rapacious host disease of the skin. And lastly, this is the, one of the more extreme forms, the very uh, sclerotic form, what we call bone hide or uh, pipe stem, right? So you can see these legs are, are very uh, rigid looking. They look like pipe. Uh, piping, and that's because the fibrosis is really holding the dermis down to the bone, um, the tissue covering the bone. So in situations like this, it's, it's very hard to reverse um, what we see here, and oftentimes wounds will develop in open sores because uh, the, the skin isn't very getting good blood flow or oxygenation and nutrients to the, to the skin, okay? So we have to monitor for um, broken skin and infections in these patients. So for those patients who do have the deep sclerosis, every time they come to our chronic GDHD clinic, we often test their flexibility or their range of movement. And, and some of you may have undergone this, undergone this evaluation. We ask patients to do the prayer sign, right, or the Buddha sign, right, and exactly. And we can measure how much uh, movement or um, range of movement that they have and we'll uh, either do the prayer sign or do some you know ask them to elevate their arms at their shoulders or look at how well they can flex or uh, extend their ankles and once we start treatment this is a way to assess if they're responding to treatment okay all right so as I mentioned before the nails can be affected and this is just an example of some of the nail changes in this patient he actually lost his nail bed and then example of uh, the hair follicles being involved by graft-versus-host disease. So alopecia, hair thinning, hair loss. And so when we um, think about treatment, there are several principles that we like, that transplanter doctors like to, to go by. The first thing is, well, we want to control the current symptoms that you or other patients are experiencing. We want to prevent additional organ damage minimize treatment toxicity. So we could, if we can avoid systemic steroids, uh, which we all hate, <laughs> we'll do so, um, and avoid other late treatment effects. And then at the same time, we want to make sure we're treating you with uh, medications that don't put you at risk for your original blood disorder to come back, OK? And so when we think about how we're going to treat it, the first thing that we will look at is how much is the skin involved? How much of the skin? How much of the body surface area? Um, and then what do we think how deep the chronic GVHD is affecting? Do we think it's affecting the really deep underlying tissues, or is it just really affecting the, the very superficial layer? Then we look at to see if there's other organ involvement. Are your, how are your eyes doing? How's your mouth doing? your GI tract, um, do your liver numbers look okay, okay? Uh, and in general, if, you, if only the uh, superficial, the epidermal portion of the skin is involved, it's generally very treatable, okay? But if we're dealing with a multi-organ, three or more organs being involved, or the sclerotic form of chronic graft-versus-host disease, we have to start using more aggressive treatments, systemic treatments, okay? So the most, one of the most important um, interventions to start as actually as soon as you come out of transplant is to begin regular use of moisturizers on the skin. I'm talking about medical emollients, not the emollients that are, you know, perfumey or have all these promises of anti-aging properties, but med medicinal medical grade emollients, which are like thick creams, okay? For those who uh, suffer from really bad itch, um, your doctor can prescribe anti-itch medications, either um, ointments or sometimes pills, okay? Uh, for those who have developed skin tears or ulcers, we want to prevent infection, so oftentimes we'll use antibiotics applied to the skin. Uh, usually I get a, a wound care consult service uh, evaluation. Um, sometimes patients need specialized wound dressings or need, deb need debridement if there's a lot of uh, tissue that's, that's uh, getting involved. Uh, and oftentimes, like with that patient I showed you who had the pipe stem leg, sometimes um, uh, patients will de develop a fluid accumulation uh, in their lower extremity. So we need to either wrap that we have to control the edema, either through wraps or through medications. 
so treatment options, general treat treatment options include topical treatments. Um, and what I mean by topical, again, is applying it directly to the, to the area of the tissue that's effective. Systemic treatments, which are usually either given through a pill that you in ingest or through intravenous uh, route. Uh, there's something called phototherapies or light therapy. And then, of course, supportive measures such as physical therapy, massage, all these sort of ancillary um, support services are also very important, okay? So examples of topical therapies, the first line that we go to are steroids, and there are different strengths that are available. Hydrocortisone is available over the counter. It's considered a low potency steroid, and it comes as a cream or an ointment. Your moderate strength is triamcinolone, and the more potent strength is clobetazole. So in my practice, it depends on how angry the rash looks or how diffuse. If, if the rash looks very fine and very minimal, I'll start off with a, I actually start off with a, a moderate strength. If it's a very, um, or, or it, and then I'll, I'll, I'll try that for about two to four weeks. If I don't see any improvement on a moderate strength um, steroid, I'll move up to a very potent like steroid such as clobetazole. Some patients can only need to start off on hydrocortisone, okay? And it's also important for your doctor to tell you which areas um, uh, sh shouldn't, you, shouldn't be exposed to a moderate or a strong strength, such as the face. Uh, the face should never be exposed to uh, a very strong uh, potency steroid, such as clobetazole, the same as the genital area. Okay, we tend to use either a low or moderate strength for, for those areas. Um, as I said before, these steroids can come in different formulations, lotions, creams, ointments. We tend to use ointments, but because of the viscosity, um, it tends to um, allow the, uh, the steroid, the active medication, to get into the skin better, okay? Most patients don't like ointments because it feels very greasy and, and it's very viscous, but in terms of efficacy, we feel that ointments are probably the best way to go, okay? Um, use of emollients after steroids may increase potency, but that being said, uh, for it, when you use emollient after steroids, you shouldn't apply it directly after the steroid use. You should wait at least about 30 minutes after the steroid cream or ointment has been applied. Wait 30 minutes and then put on your emollient. If your doctor's prescribing you topical uh, prograf or tacrolimus, you want to wait at least two hours before you apply an emollient, a moisturizer after that, okay? Uh, for some people, and I've actually seen very good benefit with this, uh, use of wet wraps on top of the steroid or the topical treatment will help the absorption of that medication. And, and sometimes I see a much more dramatic response to that topical treatment, okay? With the steroids, you want to be careful of being exposed to it for too long. Usually, um, you don't want to be exposed to it for more than six weeks, okay? Some transplant doctors will use it longer than that, but generally after six weeks, your skin will start to get very thin and fragile, okay? And again, I just kind of already mentioned uh, tacrolimus ointment, the, the brand name is Protopic, or there's another one called Pimacromolimus, or and the other name for that is Elodil, okay? So for those who have involvement of the mouth, the buccal mucosa, and Dr. Treister just gave a whole lecture on this, uh, options include, you know, adexamethasone, swish and spit, which is the most preferred, but there are other potent, potent uh, levels of steroid um, solutions. Um, using a steroid gel or a steroid paste directly to the lesion can help. And then um, something called intralesional steroid injections for really uh, refractory cases of ulcers can also be very beneficial, okay? Uh, for those who have involvement of their uh, the skin in the genital area, uh, water-based lubricants and topical estrogen uh, along the vulva or vagina can be helpful. And this is where it's really important to see a gynecologist who's very familiar with treating graft-versus-host disease of the genital area. Okay, moving on to systemic therapy. So again, either it comes in oral form or intravenous, right? So the first line agent that we use these days are steroids still. 
um, is proven to be the most effective. Approximately 50% of patients will respond to steroids. For the other 50% who don't respond, we have this whole other list of agents that are, um, are totally up for game, okay? So most of patients might still be on their calcineurin inhibitor. They're either their TAC or their cyclosporin. If these agents have already come off, um, your transplant doctor may put them back on to help uh, give an extra boost with the, uh, the steroids. The whole goal of, of all these agents is really to get you off the steroids as quickly as possible because we know, we all know that long-term steroids doesn't make you feel good and it has long-term late effects. So if we can add on other agents so that we can decrease the steroids as rapidly as possible, that's what we're trying to do, okay? Uh, Sirolimus is another type of immune suppressive drug that we use to treat chronic rapid-versus-host disease, mycophenolate mofetil, or the other name is Celsept. Rituximab, this is an anti-CD20 antibody uh, that we typically use for in lymphomas, patients who have lymphomas. But we know that because what it does, it targets the B cells. Um, and in chronic rapid host disease, we know that it's both the B cells and the T cells that are involved in causing this whole issue. So that's why rituximab might be brought up as an option to help basically kill off those really active B cells that are producing the antibodies that's causing the graft-versus-host disease. Imatinib is another type of pill. Um, it's, called a, it's one of the TKIs, or tyrosine kinase inhibitors, um, and it's been tested for uh, sclerodermatous chronic graft-versus-host disease. And uh, I'll say that probably in general, all of these in terms of efficacy are pretty similar between each other. The two newest agents that we're using in the clinics these days are brutinib and ruxolitinib. Abrutinib was actually just, it's the first and only FDA approved agent um, for treatment of chronic graft versus host disease uh, for those who failed steroids, okay? It was just approved last year. This is a, another medication that's typically used for lymphoma for patients who have CLL or mantle cell lymphoma because Similar to rituximab, it targets the B cells, the B, the B cells that are producing their antibodies. And we actually have seen that it can also affect the T cells. So it kind of hits both, both, both of those bad players, okay? Um, the one issue that I've seen with abrutinib in the clinic is that half of the patients can't really tolerate it very well at the dose that it's recommended at because it can cause some muscle cramps it can cause the platelets to go down. And so sometimes we have to dose reduce, keep dose reducing, or sometimes some patients just have to come off of it just because of those uh, annoying side effects. Um, and then lastly, uh, ruxolitinib, or the other name is Jacophy, uh, has been a very promising agent. There was this big uh, study that came out from Europe last, last year, actually it's probably been about two years now, where they surveyed a bunch of German physicians um, based on their experience of just using this. It wasn't in a clinical trial, it was just based on prescribing it and see what happens to their patients. And in, as a whole, these physicians saw a marked improvement in skin, chronic uh, graphosis of the skin, the GI tract, and a little bit in, in the liver, but mainly skin and GI tract with this agent. So it's actually be being tested right now in a, a randomized phase three trial in the United States. They are, patients are randomly being allocated to either a ruxolitinib with steroids or just uh, steroids without ruxolitinib, steroids and a placebo. And it will probably take a couple of years to get that data, maybe over more than two years, but hopefully we'll see that this has very high efficacy, okay? And the other thing is, coming from the University of Utah, we also have a couple clinical trials coming out or available. Right now, we are actually testing a hedgehog inhibitor for those who have sclerodermatis, the really fibrotic form of the graft versus host disease. We're testing this new agent to see if it can help prevent any progression or reverse some of the fibrosis. And the drug is called Vismodigib. And what we've seen so far, again, there are side effects, muscle cramping, altered taste change, but for half of the patients who are on it, they've actually uh, felt improvement in some of the restriction 
uh, that they had previously. One of our patients, a female patients who is very active in yoga and stretching, actually feels that she can even do more now with her, her exercise. And another patient who was having very severe muscle cramps because of the GVHD is reporting improvement in, in the muscle cramps. And, and this affects quality of life, it improves quality of life. So we actually have that at the Huntsman Cancer Institute. And then soon we'll be opening up a trial where we're testing something called photophoresis, which I'm gonna talk about, uh, with a JAK1 inhibitor and not use steroids at all for first line treatment of chronic graft versus host disease. So that's in the works right now. I mean, that's, that's the way that I think we're gonna have to go in, in treatment of, of chronic graft versus host disease. We know that long-term steroids are bad, and so now we're trying to you know, test agents where we don't have to use steroids or use steroids for long periods of time. Okay, so moving on to phototherapies or light therapy, some of you may have uh, utilized PUVA. So this is, uh, the P stands for sorolin, and then it's ultraviolet uh, uh, A rays, uh, like what I wrote there. Um, it's only used for skin involvement, and it can be effective, especially if there's no deep sclerotic GVHD that's present. Really, it's for sort of, I, I know physicians who do try it for sclerotic GVHD, but the efficacy is, is probably not optimal, okay? It's not, uh, recommended to, to use in patients who have a prior history of skin cancer, and it can also be a risk factor for skin cancer. So what in this process, what happens is that patients will ingest or uh, have applied to their skin a chemical called sorolin, and then these UV ultraviolet rays will be um, uh, shown on the skin and will activate the sorolin. And what what happens is that this basically immunosuppresses, it kind of quenches the immune reaction that's going on. It makes the T cells and the B cells kind of quiet so that it, it, it uh, makes the whole GVHD process quiescent, okay? Um, and then other uh, phototherapies that have been used in the past is also using UVA1, UVB, narrowband UVB. So we typically don't use PUVA uh, where I am at right now at the University of Utah. We rely on something called extracorporeal photophoresis or ECP as our next line of therapy after patients don't respond to thyroid. Have any of you ever received photophoresis? Okay, actually quite a bit. All right, I would say almost half the room, okay? So it's a similar concept, except that this time, the patient sits at the machine. It looks like a hemodialysis machine, actually, a little bit. And they usually have a, a, a central line placed, and the machine draws the blood out of them. It separates the red blood cells and takes all the white blood cells, separates filters out, um, and then the white blood cells are exposed to that chemical sorolin, and then it's kind of zapped by the, the ultraviolet light, okay? And then it's reintroduced into the body. So the patient doesn't have to take any pill or uh, have any chemical applied to their skin. Their white blood cells are actually taken out of their body, exposed to the chemical, the light, and then put back into them. And then again, how it works is basically kind of suppresses the whole GVHD reaction. Um, We've seen really great benefit from uh, the use of ECP in both the acute and the chronic graft versus host disease. Uh, in the presence of, in the absence of no clinical trial, this is our standard therapy at the University of Utah. We use it for patients who don't respond to steroids if they have skin GVHD, uh, uh, GI GVHD, liver GVHD, lung GVHD, and uh, we actually see really good response. I've actually put a couple of my patients who have the sclerotic form of GVHD, and although there's no cosmetic change, uh, at least in the first eight to 12 weeks, there's actually, with physical therapy, there can be a functional change. Uh, my patients do report, I have one patient who has lung GVHD, um, and I got, and then came down with an infection and had a GVHD, GVHD flu, and I was able to get his GVHD back under control and get him back on his home uh, oxygen uh, requirement with the use of ECP. Again, with other patients with you know, physical therapy and sometimes a little bit of steroids, um, we can actually see skin softening and improved function, okay? Uh, and of course, as I stressed before, this really can't be just done by itself. There are 
um, additional uh, services that should be looked into that you should all participate in if you're being treated for uh, graft-versus-host disease of the skin, particularly the sclerotic form. Gentle stretching every day is, can be very beneficial. Uh, physical therapy, I don't know how many of you just came out of the fatigue and function workshop where the physical therapists were doing some uh, exercises. Ryan actually works with me in the clinic. The way we have our clinic set up is I have all my chronic graft versus host disease patients and actually all my post-transplant patients get at least 30 minutes to 45 minutes of physical therapy with Ryan and he works with them on specific areas where there's a lot of stiffness or lack of movement and sends them home with exercises and follows them up every time they come in for their ECP treatment. And this combination makes a difference. I didn't realize how important it was where I was before. We didn't have physical therapy integrated in our clinics. But coming to being at Utah for the past three years and seeing this combination, it, I'm really impressed by the changes that some of my patients have. Okay. They're much more functional, they can move better, it improves their quality of life, and they're just happier. <laughs> so I can't stress enough the importance of physical therapy. And then for some people who have the financial resources to do this, deep massages can help loosen up the scar tissue, the fibrosis, okay? So as, just as importantly as that treatment is preventing, we want to prevent any flare of GVHD, we want to prevent any onset of graft versus host disease, and we want to reduce the risk of any skin cancer that can develop down the years for patients who do have graft versus host disease, right? So I'm, I think all of you have been educated on this from your transplant doctor, uh, but you definitely want to avoid uh, excessive sun exposure or intense sun exposure. So you, and this occurs typically between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. throughout the day, okay? If you are going out, you want to use a sunscreen. The uh, National Institutes of Health recommend using a sunscreen SPF level of greater than 20. I actually tell my patients to use an SPF minimum of 30, okay, with broad spectrum UVA and UVB protection. Um, you want to have protective clothing, uh, long sleeve shirts and pants, uh, wear hats, um, and avoid any photosensitizing agents, any skin lighteners. And actually, a couple of my patients, and they actually have some boxes out there. They've been adding, there's this special detergent that you can add into your clothes wash that has that um, protective chemical for sun protection. Because um, one thing that, we sh that you should all should know about is that patients with chronic graft versus host disease are at risk for developing skin cancer down the road. Okay, And the three skin cancers that we monitor for are squamous cell cancer, basal cell cancer, and melanoma. Okay, and as you can see here, uh, through research, we have found that the risk of squamous cell cancer is anywhere from three to 11 times higher in patients who have skin involvement. And the average time of diagnosis is between two to seven years. For basal cell, the risk is anywhere between, it's around two, two, two times more than the general population um, and can occur about seven to nine years after, after the diagnosis. And then malignant melanoma, even though I, I wasn't able to find how much the risk is increased, it can occur. It's not as um, often as squamous or basal, but it, it can occur, and it usually will occur one to four years after. Okay? And while we advocate for all of our patients to see a, a dermatologist and have a skin check at least once a year, I'm putting these pictures up here so that you are aware and that you're able to do your own self-assessment every few months, okay? And be able to know what you're looking for, okay? So this is an example of, and I hope I'm not, I'm probably in the way of some of the view here, an example of basal cell cancer, okay? So these lesions can look very pearly or waxy. Um, usually they form in sun-exposed areas. Uh, sometimes they're called fleshy-looking. They can be any color, okay? They can be clear, they can be pink, uh, red. Um, I even seen sort of a light blue tinge, okay? They're usually translucent, that's why they're called pearly. Um, sometimes you can see little tiny blood vessels or capillaries in them. Uh, and sometimes they are scaly with raised edges and they, and they really uh, spread. Squamous cell cancers, on the other hand, usually are firm red nodules. Sometimes they have a crusty uh, overlaying crust, and sometimes they could be bleeding. Um, 
uh, sometimes you might think of it as a new sore that just kind of popped out of nowhere. And that, that can be a, a little bit alarming. That's something that you should have a doctor look at, okay? Um, and again, a new sore or coming out of an old area scarring, okay? And then melanoma, which this is one example of melanoma, usually, uh, unlike these two guys, melanoma is very irregular appearing. It's usually flat. Um, there's border irregularity. It, the color can change over time. It can become progressively darker, usually is what I've seen. Um, and then the diameter is usually greater than a pencil eraser, okay? And then melanoma, it changes over time. So that's why if you, if you, start see, you first see something unusual, look at it again a month later or three months later. If you start seeing changes in the way it looks, that's concerning. You should tell your doctor or see a, a skin doctor, okay? Because melanoma, once it spreads, if it's not caught early enough and not treated early enough, it can be very difficult to treat, particularly if melanoma, and it likes to spread. Melanoma is a very aggressive skin cancer, okay? And it can go to the liver, it can go to the brain, it can go to the lungs. So this is one that you definitely want to treat as early as possible. Um, and melanoma just doesn't have to be on the face and the or the arms or sun exposed areas. Sometimes patients will actually have an area, this abnormal brown lesion along the nail bed. So you should always look at your nails as well and your, your toenails. Procedures to avoid if you have active skin, GVHD, try not to undergo any cosmetic procedures or surgery, no skin lightening products or tanning products or vigorous outdoor activities if you're gonna be exposed to intense sunlight. Um, more precautions or supportive treatments. If you are on steroids or an immune suppression, your doctor should have you on preventative antibiotics, right? Uh, especially antifungal, antibacterial, acyclovir to prevent any shingles outbreak. Uh, people who are on steroids, patients who are on steroids, bone strengthening agents are necessary. Vitamin D supplementation with calcium to keep your bones strong because steroids can weaken bones over a long period of time. And then those patients on steroids should also make sure they get a bone densometry scan at least once a year, if, if not every six months. So lastly, it's important to take ownership of your health. Report your symptoms, okay? Don't be shy, don't blow it off, but tell your doctor, protect your skin, moisturize regularly, even if you don't have graft versus host disease. Do a skin self-check, do yourself a favor, okay? And prevent another cancer from happening down the road. Okay, and then just a quick summary. I won't have to go through this, but essentially it highlights everything I you know, just talked about. Incorporate stretching, physical therapy, and massage. I think that's super important. And treating chronic GVHD can be a long process, but don't lose hope. We are coming out with new medications. We're testing them. We're trying to avoid steroids. So hopefully in the future we'll, get, we'll find that magic pill. Okay? Thank you. You mentioned uh, a trial that's being done at Huntsman, and you also mentioned a Jacophy yeah. combination drug that's being tested. Yeah. Could you repeat those? Yeah. So ruxolitinib, with a, it's called ruxolitinib, R-U-X-O-L-I-T-I-N-I-B, or otherwise parentheses Jack 1 and 2, is being tested uh, in a phase 3 trial. And some of the centers involved in that uh, are Vanderbilt, um, Washington University, I believe Moffitt's involved in that. I'm going to try to bring that to the Huntsman. I'm gonna see if we can open it up at the University of Utah. I'm not sure if Colorado is involved in it yet, um, but that's testing that, that medication that the Germans uh, reported doing very well with steroids uh, versus um, uh, steroids in a placebo or non rocks And then the one that we're working on, we have a hedge, or the one that we have open at the university is called, uh, it's a hedgehog inhibitor, or the name is Vismodigib. And that's for patients who have that sclerotic form of, of graft-versus-host disease. Repeat the name of that. Vismodigib, V as in Victor, I-S-M-O-D-E-G-I-B. 
And for anyone who's interested in clinical trials, the best site to go to, the website, is clinicaltrials.gov. One word, clinicaltrials.gov. And if you type in the search word GVHD or graft versus host disease, you will see a whole uh, panel of clinical trials that are going on across the nation. And there are a few handouts in the back. Um, oh, okay, perfect. If you guys want to pick those up. On your way out. Is there any rhyme or reason how these things progress? So, you know, I started with the rash, and then I started having the sclerotic, and it seemed like, but now there's nerve involvement, and is, is there any, like, order to this? One begets the next symptom? Yeah, I mean, usually with uh, patients, usually it does start off with a rash. Uh, the superficial compo part of the skin is involved, and then if it's not, even with treatment, patients who are treated effectively for the rash, there is no rhyme and reasons. These patients can still have involvement of the underlying uh, dermis uh, layer or the subcutaneous layer. Um, we, we do our best. We at least hope that intervening early will, uh, will prevent uh, progression, and it does sometimes, but then there are other patients too who we treat effectively the rash, but then still a few months later it'll come back again, and then deeper layers can be involved as well. So no clear-cut path, yeah. How do you feel about using Kenalog injections when you have flare-ups? When you have which which one? The flare-ups of the GV, GVH oh, in flare -ups? your skin. Yeah. In, for, um, in skin lesions or mouth? Uh, in the on the legs and the feet, in mainly the feet. joints. I have not personally uh, used steroid injections in actual localized areas of of, uh, of GVHD. I actually haven't heard too many transplanters doing that. I have colleagues who have used Botox for um, areas of very um, rigid um, uh, muscle, or, or people who are having muscle cramps. Um, and it's actually helped for these people, just injections of Botox, but I have never used uh, steroids. Do you have any experience or colleagues? Have you ever used at Harvard? Yeah. Yeah, give steroids, yeah. I actually don't have personal experience with that. Okay, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, we took our hus my husband to the um, dermatologist, and I did have him look at his feet. In the beginning, we wondered if maybe it was athlete's foot or if it was G GVHD mm -hmm. um, between the toes. Um, I have still been treating it. I put creams and stuff on, but not the, um, you know, like the tacrolimus creams uh -huh. or anything like that. Um, he does have a little bit of thickening between between his toes, and I don't know if that was scarring from possibly having athlete's foot between his toes, or mm -hmm. if it's actual the sclerodermis. Yeah, so GVHT can happen, what we call acral, acral GVHT of the skin, and it can happen along the skin between toes and fingers. Um, what have you, have you tried steroids, just, exper just to see if they've helped, or? Um, a couple of weeks ago I did, and it didn't seem to help. Okay. I don't know if maybe I was using the wrong one. Okay. And it, it, everything, yeah, depends on how long you use it and if you're using it twice a day consistently. Um, have you biopsied? Has it been biopsied at all? Has it been suggested to biopsy it? No. He, he goes back to the dermatologist this week, so okay. I'll bring there it There are a couple again. of ways. I mean, you could try a, a more potent dose of steroid uh, cream or ointment and apply it twice a day and see if there's any changes. That you need to give it at least probably a couple of weeks, okay? okay? Well, will the thickening go away? It can, okay. it can if it's GVHD, yeah. Um, you could also try experimentally some protopic, the topical tacrolimus, and okay. see if that helps. We but probably that. the most definitive way and, and the fastest way of knowing is just to do a, a skin biopsy and see whether it's athlete's foot or versus some inflammatory condition. It seems to respond better to the um, antifungal creams. It, well, okay. But so, now yeah. I've got the scarring. It's so. got the scarring. Yeah, biopsy me. I would ask, ask the dermatologist what he thinks about a biopsy. Yeah. I've seen like in recent years a lot of more studies coming out um, describing kind of the negative effects of sunscreen, like oxybenzene and things like that that are uh, endocrine disruptors or actually can cause genetic mutations in cells. Uh -huh. 
Is there a point where using sunscreen becomes counterproductive? Is there, or is there a certain sunscreen that you recommend to your patients that doesn't contain a lot of those no, actually, I would chemicals. have to read the data to see how they came out with those results and how they tested that and what sunscreens they, they tested. Um, as of right now, the, without knowing the data, we are just going by the benefits of sunscreen preventing flares uh, of GVHD. So we continue to recommend it. We don't recommend any particular brand of uh, sunblock. Sorry, sunblock. Um, and so, but that's, that's an interesting uh, uh, issue that you bring up. Do you think that the mineral sunscreens, like the zinc oxide and stuff, are enough? Do they block enough of the UV spectrum? Uh, zinc, yeah, zinc oxide should, yeah. Okay. yeah. But I would have to go back. I would want to look at that data myself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions okay. now? Well, I'll be up here if anyone has any more private want to ask me questions privately. Thank you. Yep, thank you.